our spiritual lives, where our lives should be focused all the time. This week's portion, as most of us know, is a interesting point in time. The Israelites leave the land of Egypt. They are promised from the beginning that they will enter into the land of Israel. And as the Torah explains, the land of Israel does not represent simply the physical place in the world, but more importantly, it represents an elevated state of consciousness, an elevated state of connection to the life of the Creator. Before being ready to enter into the land, it says, and as we spoke in years past, there's actually a discussion in the Zohar about the Kabbalists, whether it was an idea of the Israelites, whether, whether it was Mo, the idea of Moses, whether it was the idea of God, of the Creator, to send spies into the land of Israel. What was the purpose of sending the spies? It's not clear. I want to understand what their purpose was. But what we do know is that when they came back, whatever the purpose was, their return was very tragic. They come back, they tell all the Israelites at that time, this is a terrible land. Eretz Ocheret Yoshvea is the land that eats up those who inhabit it. We, we don't want to go there. Many, too many of the Israelites believe them, accept this message, and from there begins a 40-year period where none of those people, having lost their consciousness, will be able to enter into the land of Israel. They all travel throughout the desert, and that is where they die. And then only the next generation enters into the land of Israel. Clearly a very important story, but not historically important, but rather as it relates to our spiritual world. Because if we understand that the land of Israel represents the goal, hopefully, of each one of us, right? The goal of the land of Israel represents the highest state of connection to the life of the Creator, the highest state of consciousness, which is the goal of our lives. What is it about the story of the spies that we need to learn so that we, as Hashem, are able to enter into the land of Israel, are able to accomplish the ultimate state of connection for which our soul came into this world? So to understand this, there's a beautiful teaching that I shared this with the Chevrolet. Whenever I have the opportunity to share, for one of the capitalists, especially there are capitalists who lived life in one place in relative peace, and then there are those capitalists whose lives were with a lot of movement, with a lot of uh, force, exile, and movement. This capitalist, his name was Abitza Arama. He was a great capitalist in Spain during the time of the expulsion and the Inquisition. And uh, after leaving Spain, he then went to Portugal and then had to travel further. So a tumultuous life. But he's one of the great capitalists of Spain, and he reveals to us a secret with which we can understand, we can understand not only the secret of this week, of this Shabbat, what is available to us, but we can also understand a fundamental purpose of our lives and the work that we should be doing, and the focus that we should have. He says the following. When the world is cre was created, there was an order. And if you remember the story, the way it's written in the book of Bereshit, in the book of Genesis, it goes from the lower beings on all the days preceding. Man, humanity, is created on the last day of creation, after everything else has been created. He says that is an indication of greatness, which means that always what comes next, right? We all know that the iPhone 7S is better than the, the original iPhone. <laughs> and so too in creation, it is always the next version that is meant to not only be of a greater level, consciousness of connection, but also, and this is important to understand, an important ability to control all that came before it. So, man being created on the last day of creation, that is meant to be an indication of the power that we are supposed to have. We are supposed to have the ability to control, to rule over nature. 
That's not the case, unfortunately, for most of us, but it is why we are created. What does it mean to rule over nature? What does it mean to have the control over the natural world? So he explains and reveals really what it is, a unique, a secret that, that I don't think most of us have heard before, a unique secret that gives us a beautiful but powerful understanding about nature. Most of us believe, even those who, of us who have seen miracles, who believe in our ability to awaken miracles, the ability of miracles to occur, most of us believe that there is what is called nature. Nature. Nature is created in a certain way, it follows certain rules, certain orders, it goes on like that forever. For instance, when the Israelites were standing in front of the sea, and the Egyptians were behind them, a miracle occurred, the splitting of the sea, the sea split open, and the Israelites were able to enter into the dry land to the other side and save their lives and their families. A miracle, which means that okay, nature would determine that an ocean stays together forever, does not split up, does not break open. A miracle occurred, allowing the Israelites to walk through. So you have nature, this is what, the way most people understand, even those of us who understand the power and the ability of miracles, there's nature, the way things go all the time, and then there's miracles, things that break nature, that change nature. He says that that is the wrong understanding. Furthermore, if you maintain that understanding, it makes it very difficult to actually create miracles, to actually create change. What is the real understanding? So he says, there are really two types of nature. From the beginning of time, there were always two types of nature. One of them he calls the known nature, or as we'll come to see, we can call it stupid nature. What is the stupid nature? Let's use an example of a, you know, I think unfortunately in our lives, many of us have met stupid people. What are stupid people? Stupid people who, you tell them, let's say, to do something, and even if they can understand you, they'll go ahead and do it. It won't take into account other things, right? If somebody's mind is not so developed, and let's say you tell them, I want you to take a box from here across the street, they might just grab the box and run, not look at the cars that are coming, not see if there's people in their way, they might hit them. They just go, you tell them to go, they go. That's an undeveloped consciousness. You, just, you do what you were told, and you just go ahead, you don't take into account who's around, what's around, what's going on, new information, you just go. And if you look at nature, the way we see it, one can understand why the Kabbalists would call that, the known nature, as the not conscious nature. Because nature doesn't pay attention to things. If a hurricane happens, usually it goes in whatever natural direction it goes, or a tornado happens, a natural, any type of natural damage or disaster has a way that it goes, usually. So we'll call that, either known nature or stupid nature. There's another form of nature, a more elevated form of nature. Nature really as it should be. Nature with consciousness. Nature with thought. Called smart nature. What's smart nature? Smart nature is when nature sees, yes, this is the way things Ordinarily go. The ocean, for instance, says, well, my nature, my basic nature is to remain connected in one form of body of water. But then when it sees the Israelites, and it sees Moses, it starts thinking. It starts using its consciousness. It's saying, one second, maybe these people, maybe Moses deserves for me to change a little bit. Maybe these people deserve for me to let them go through. That's smart nature. It's not a miracle. It's just that nature now is thinking. So there are two natures. There is stupid nature, the known nature, and there is smart nature. Smart nature can change. Smart nature takes into account who's around, what is around, what is happening, new information, conscious nature. 
This, he explains, is not the source of miracles, but a new understanding of the way the world is meant to work. So when we said before that when man was created at the end of creation, the last, what was the reason? Because man was meant to control nature, but not control in, in the sense, I'm going to tell you to do this. I, most of us, when we think about a miracle, that's a miracle. <coughs> Things go in one way and suddenly the person claps you about it for this reason or another. Needs help right now for nature to change. I need nature that is normal, that is natural, that is stupid, to suddenly get smart in a second. It doesn't work like that. Even with a child, right? It takes time to educate. Right? How many of all of us who've had children, all of even those who work with other people, you know, somebody might come and initially not have a complete understanding, and it takes time to teach, to understand in a deeper way. So control doesn't mean that we're all even ultimately, and when we talk about the end of the direction, when we talk about Moshiach, it's not that suddenly we're all gonna have these superpowers and be able to tell, you know, to tell the ocean you're gonna split, or tell the sun you're gonna stop. It's that we have we will have gone through a process, us, humanity, and nature, where we are able to invest nature with consciousness, we're able to educate nature, and then nature starts working in a smart way. That's Mashiach. That's the end of the correction. Nature does not suddenly become something different, but simply it's the same nature, but with consciousness. It's the same nature with understanding. So when we talk about the ability or the creation of man for the purpose ultimately to have the ability to control nature, not in a way that maybe we thought previously, suddenly without a superpower to be able to create a miracle or to change things. Rather, it is a process by which, and we'll have to understand how, but it's a process by which we educate nature. We teach nature to live, to exist, and act with consciousness. All parts of nature, whether inanimate, vegetable, animal. When we look throughout history and we look at the miracles, we understand them now in a different way. When Abraham was thrown into the fire, why did the fire burn Abraham? Not because Abraham was so spiritually powerful, he was able with a superpower to say to the, to the fire, don't burn me. No. Throughout his life, we have to look, we'll talk about how we do this. Throughout his life, he was educating nature. He was investing nature with consciousness. So fire that's stupid just burns. It doesn't pay attention to who it is, where they are, why they're there. Burns. Smart nature, smart fire says, one second, who's this standing in front of me? It's Abraham. What kind of person is Abraham? Does he deserve to be burned? Does he not deserve to be burned? Fire starts thinking. And when fire thought around Abraham and said, you know what? My best decision right now is not to burn Abraham. This is the way, the true way to understand the way what others, and this is a beautiful sentence from the great Kabbalist of Isaac Ahmadi says, what stupid people call miracles, smart people call nature. And now we understand. <laughs> because miracles, as maybe we would have thought previously, is the ability to, in a moment, change with some supreme power what is happening. But in reality, what real miracles are, is the ability to infuse nature with consciousness, with thought, smart nature. So this is the understanding. There are two types of nature. There is stupid nature, what we know as, as common nature, no nature, which does not think, which just does. And natural nature, common nature, stupid nature is dangerous because it doesn't pay attention to who the person is. If there are people, it just goes. Smart nature thinks. Smart nature has consciousness. Even as we said, even in inanimate in objects. So for instance, let's say a bullet is, 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 is um, shot at somebody. The, if the bullet is stupid, as most bullets are, stupid nature, it just goes straight, it doesn't ask questions. But if it's smart, if it was invested somehow with wisdom, with consciousness, it asks the question, if I go straight, I'm going to hit this person. Is this person somebody who should be hit with a bullet? Maybe not, and maybe it goes around. So we're not talking about just animals, we're not talking about just the vegetative world, but 
inanimate objects as well. Everything in this world, and even people of a lower nature. The ultimate state of being, the ultimate purpose for which every single one of us came to this world, is to be able to invest the nature around us, and ultimately, collectively, the nature of the world with consciousness, with wisdom, becoming a smart nature that no longer can or does harm to, to people. No miracles, but rather a smart, wise, conscious nature. How do you do that? So we understand that the, the purpose is no longer to simply be able to draw some superpower so that I can create a miracle when I need it. How do we invest? How do we create the second form, the elevated form of nature, which is called smart nature? So there's two ways that I want to speak about that are so important, again, not just in doing them, because some of us might be doing some of them, but doing them with this consciousness, using these tools with this consciousness. I'm sure we can all begin to understand the benefits that not the shame that we will be able to receive once we are investing the nature around us, the nature around us with wisdom, with consciousness, smart nature. How do we do it? So there's two ways that I'd like to speak about. One, the capitalists explain this, the Vashla, the Repetitor, often would refer to this teaching, as the individual behaves, so too the light the Creator behaves with that person. Each one of us has a smart nature and a stupid nature. I think most of us are aware of what our stupid nature is, right? What's our stupid nature? Our stupid nature is when somebody says something that upsets me, I get angry. Somebody does something I don't like, I lash out at them. I'm sure if we look back at this week, we can find many examples where we simply lived with our stupid nature. That's our stupid nature. And, chas to the degree that we live and act with our stupid nature, nature around us remains stupid for us too. The more actively we awaken our smart nature, right? Our smart nature says, you know what? Even though this person upset me, I'm not going to yell at them. Even though this person hurt me, I'm not going to lash out at them. Even though I have this selfish desire, I'm not going to act upon if it's going to hurt somebody else, if it's going to do harm to somebody else, if it's going to do harm to myself, I'm going to use my smart nature to overrule, to control my stupid nature. To the degree that we are using our smart nature, our smart nature, my smart nature, to overrule my stupid nature, to that degree, I am investing nature around me to behave in a smart way towards me. Because nature around me is an effect of me, of my behavior. The more I live with my stupid nature, the more nature will be stupid around me. Not thinking, just doing. The more I behave with my smart nature, the more I cause nature around me to behave in a smart way. <coughs> so that's the first way. And we understand now, again, to be clear, that just use an example of a week or a month or a year, if in the past week, I behaved in a way that saw my stupid nature acting more often than my smart nature, getting angry because that's my nature, doing this action selfishly because that's what I desire right there, my stupid nature desires in that moment, then if next week that same individual needs a miracle, that's a miracle again, now it's not suddenly, oh, okay, I'll make a connection, I'll get some power, I'll be able to change nature. That's the way it works. How did you teach nature last week? What was your education level towards nature last week? Well, if most of the week you behave with your stupid nature, the nature is still stupid. And the fact that today, suddenly, you need nature to change, it's not smart enough to change. You can't. It's still stupid, it goes straight ahead. So the first way that we, and this is again, a, it's not about happening in one day, but it's a process of continual education of nature, a continu continual infusion into nature of consciousness and thought. But it depends on how we do. To the degree that we do not live with our stupid nature, but live with our wise nature, to that degree we are infusing all of nature around us 
right? Even though, to use the example of Abraham or Daniel, who was thrown into the lion's den, why did the lions touch Daniel? Again, it wasn't like what maybe we would like to think, right? Because it's easier to think that way. Daniel could have done whatever he wanted in the months prior. But because he was connected in that moment, he said to the Creator, let's create a miracle so that the lions don't eat me up. No. What happened was that for the months prior or the years prior, Daniel was teaching nature, be wise, think. Don't just go ahead with what is known as stupid nature or, or no nature. So then when he found himself in the situation, the lions started thinking. Because they were wise lions. They were nature infused with wisdom. They said, one second, we're very hungry on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's Daniel in front of us. This is the person who's been teaching us. This is the, the person who's been awakening us in all of nature. It's not right. It was not, again, that in that moment suddenly Daniel was able to awaken a miracle. But rather, he had been educating nature through his actions throughout his life. And the nature around him was wise. Nature around him had wisdom and understanding and decided this is not the best way to do it. Let's do it another way. <coughs> so that is the first way that we can rule over nature. It doesn't happen in a moment. It's a process of continual control of our smart nature over our stupid nature, and that affects all of nature around us. The more active we are in living with our smart nature, the more we infuse nature around us with wisdom. And then, this other Shem, when we do need nature to shift, when we need nature to change, whether it's the inanimate, whether it's the animal, whether it's another person, suddenly it starts happening. The bullet goes around the person, the lions don't bite the person, the water doesn't drown the person. Nature becomes smart. The Kabbalists say, before we go on to the next point, that this is a great thing, I think, I know for myself, and I hope for many of us, an inspiring teaching, but this, the, we have to keep in mind that while going in one direction, which is as we keep, if, as I'll show you, we keep investing nature with wisdom, it gets smarter and more supportive out of our lives. The opposite is true as well. Nature is not static. Even a state of stupid nature can become even more stupid. <coughs> that although nature in its regular state, let's say for instance, the ocean stays in water, but if an individual or a collective of people start behaving within their own lives more and more with their stupid nature and less and less with their smart nature, not only does nature not then become wise or change from them, but actually it becomes more and more stupid and it becomes more and more damaging to the person. Unfortunately then we can find why there are times when a person is in a, let's say in nature or something happens, it doesn't make sense. Well maybe, Nature became not just regular stupid, became even more stupid, <coughs> less understanding, and it damages more and more. So it's important to understand that this isn't just a one-way street from where we are to making nature around us more wise by being more wise in our actions ourselves and ruling our stupid nature, our selfish <coughs> nature. But if we go backwards, which means if this week, if last week we were at 50-50, meaning 50% 50 of our actions were based on our stupid nature of getting angry, of acting selfishly, <coughs> and 50% were on controlling ourselves with our smart consciousness, with our smart nature, and next week it goes 60-40, which means 60% of our actions now become <coughs> more selfish, more of the desire to see the self alone, more of the stupid nature than nature itself even becomes more stupid towards us. And we don't want to call it miracles, right? But the opposite of miracles of Islam can also be. It's important to keep that in mind. But on the positive way, if we take this teaching and live it, we understand that it is our actions, how we use our smart nature over our stupid nature that starts investing nature around us with wisdom. Smart nature that supports us and brings us what others, as now we understand, what the people who don't understand might call miracles, for us it will be, Bezat Hashem, the smart nature. Nature as it should be. <coughs> That's the first way. The first way that we can effectuate smart nature to be around us. The second, and this brings us really to the, to the purpose, really, of, of the center, 
is to invest the world with wisdom. What is the purpose of the study of the Zohar, the connection to the Zohar? As we will read this in, this in this next section of the Zohar, it says that when the Mashiach comes, when the final redemption occurs, it says, Umala ha'aretz de'a et Hashem. The earth will be filled with wisdom. It doesn't say people will be filled with wisdom. There's another way to say it. You want to say the people, the world, the people of the world will be wise. You could say umalak umalu ha'anashim de'ah Hashem. You would say man, humanity suddenly will be filled with wisdom. It's understanding, but that's not what it says. When it talks about Mashiach, when it talks about the end of the collection, it says umalak ha'aretz de'ah Hashem. The earth, nature, will be filled with wisdom. That's our purpose. Our purpose, and the, the purpose of the study of Kabbalah specifically, the light of the Zohar, is to spread wisdom to the world, to the earth, to nature. Which means that every single time we study from the Zohar now, it should not simply be, I need this light, or I want this light. Where I'm standing right here, right now, is I'm going to read from the Zohar. I want this earth under, underneath me to be filled with wisdom. I want the nature around me. Why? If you, and if you read in the Zohar, you'll see this in the next story we're going to share. Why is the Mishimon by Yochai traveling all the time? Why do you stay home? Like we like, right? We have a beautiful place. Let's sit here. Let's all study together for the next 50 years. Why does the Mishimon by Yochai do that? I'm sure his students have arranged a beautiful home for him and a place where he can call people to come and study. But the Mishimon didn't do that. The Mishimon was always fine. The Mishimon was going from this city to that city. The Mishimon was in the middle of the forest. He sat down in the cave. Why? Because he understood that his purpose, that our purpose, is not simply to draw light for myself and to myself, but that the real purpose of humanity and the real purpose of every single one of us is to spread wisdom into nature, to spread wisdom into this world, so that it not only does not harm, but Bezat Hashem supports and elevates. And then we're the second tool, we ask the question, how do we create this new elevated nature? By the study of Kabbalah, specifically the revelation greater and greater of the light of the Zohar in the world. <laughs> to fill nature with wisdom, creating a smart nature that can no longer do harm and only elevates and supports and heals. That's the work. But you have to be conscious of that. Too often it becomes, you know, I'm going to, I need the, I need the light of the Zohar. It's true, we all need the light of the Zohar, but that's not a real purpose. The world, more importantly, the natural world, the earth, needs the light of the Zohar. And that's the way we need to be revealing this light. And that's the way we need to be thinking. You know, so one, of the, one of the students asked me the other, the other week, you know, there was a person put a Zohar in a certain place and still, Something happened. How could that be? Yeah. The Zohar in one place, or you know, some good people might ask, I can't scan the Zohar today. How did something happen to not possibly happen to me today? Many answers to that, but now we understand an important one. The power of the Zohar and the power of our actions are an education process. Nature does not go from stupid nature to the smartest form of nature in one day or in one moment or in one Zohar. Our purpose is to continually invest consciousness, wisdom into nature. And while it's true that nature that had zero consciousness and zero czar one day, tomorrow there's one czar there, there's one aspect of the study of the czar there, it becomes a little bit smarter. But if not, completely wise, how many of us, the first day we began studying, went from complete lack of understanding to complete wisdom? It doesn't work that way. So when you understand that the purpose of the czar, and the purpose of our spiritual work is not in one day everything changes, but it's a process of educating the world around us, of, of investing greater and greater wisdom and understanding in all of nature around us. Ultimately, yes. <clears throat> Ultimately, when we get to the state of Balaha Aves, the Ayat Hashem, when the entire earth is filled and infused with this consciousness, then everything changes. Until then, it's a process. We, our purpose, and specifically the purpose of we said the first step, the spiritual work that we do, ruling our smart nature over our stupid nature, it's a process. 
Educating the world with the life of the Zohar, the physical world, the natural world with the life of the Zohar, is a process. That's why it's not enough. You know, some people say, you know, well, I read a minute of Zohar today, or I read five minutes of Zohar today, or I gave out one Zohar, or I have a Zohar in my home. It's a continual process of educating nature. It never stops until the end. It never stops until the end of the correction. Very important to understand. So I'd like to share the section from the Zohar. It's a lengthy, and if you have the opportunity, I strongly recommend to read the entire story. Uh, it's, it's lengthy, so I won't read all of it, I'll just read a few parts of it. It's a story in the Zohar in the Bayanga, in starting from section 338. It tells the story of two of the Shimon Bar Yochai students, and of course, what were they doing again? They weren't sitting comfortably at home, they were traveling. <laughs> Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yossi were traveling on the way. Again, because they understood. They understood the purpose of the spiritual work. They understood the purpose of the life of the Tsar, the life of the Shimon Bayokai, which is to go around the world and move and create wisdom within nature. They were studying. Again, as I said, 338, it begins in the book of Bayokai. And Suddenly, as they're sitting and studying, as they were sitting, a bird came and started making noise in front of them. Now, because of the Chia and Yossi understood and were invested in nature with wisdom, nature was supporting them. So the Chia and Yossi say, Why is this bird coming here? We know that throughout our life we are investing nature with wisdom. But it must be it's coming to help us. And they said, Amara Bechia, Bechia said, Nekomahaba, he's telling us to move from here. The Vale Nabri Turaya Hakamishkafe, because it's probably something dangerous about to happen. So again, as I said, there's many lessons from the story, but why did the bird do this? Very simply. It wasn't a miracle. But rather, nature, in this case, this bird said, there are these two people who are changing nature, changing their own nature, investing nature with wisdom. Something negative is about to happen where they're sitting right now. You have to go tell them. So the bird goes and tells them. Not a miracle, but an effect of them, of the Chia and Rabbi Yossi, throughout their life, the students of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, teaching nature. And the Ahad of Rishayim, as they left, they looked back at the spot where they were sitting. They saw that there were these thieves. In those days, certainly these thieves were not people who just took their money. Kadosh would have killed them, they went to that spot where they were sitting. Nature was not there. He talked, and then something else happened. Suddenly there appeared a cave to protect them. Why did suddenly a cave appear? A miracle. It's a miracle. Because they had invested nature throughout their lives with their wisdom and their actions. Nature was there to support them. Then, the story continues, they study there, there was their life there, they're investing in nature with wisdom. And suddenly two merchants come by. The two merchants come by, and they're sitting there, and they start studying, and Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yossi, who in the cave, welcome them into the cave. <coughs> suddenly, as they're studying and they're talking, one of the merchants mentions that he had heard one day he was traveling through a city, and he was listening, he was on one side of the wall. And he hears the Shimon Bar Yochai teaching some wisdom. He shares it with them. He asks them questions about it. They spend the whole night studying it. After studying all night, the morning comes, the merchants have to go out there and make <coughs> Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Yossi bless the two merchants who they studied with all that night. And he kissed them on the head. And they sent them on their way. And then Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Chia start speaking about their experience. He compares the revelation that Moses had, and Moses was in this world, and the revelation that Rabbi Shimon Bayotai had at hand. We know that at the time of the spilling of the sea, 
when nature became smart. It says that even the lowest person saw great visions in the supernal world. Why are these simple merchants so filled with wisdom? He says, This is because of Shimon Bayokai is filled, filling the world with wisdom. This was the work of Rabbi Shimon Bayokai. This is the work of the center. This is our work. A very small percentage of the focus of our spiritual work and connection, and especially our work around the Zohar, should be about drawing light for myself. The real purpose of Rabbi Shimon Bayochai, the real purpose of the students of Rabbi Shimon Bayochai, the real purpose of the center, is to infuse wisdom throughout the world. Infuse wisdom both throughout nature and throughout the people of the world. Amar Rabbi Yudah, Rabbi Yudah says, Zamin kutsha berichu legala razen amikin deoraita. The great secrets that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai began their revelation. There will come a time, our time, what's called the time of Mashiach. And these secrets, these deep secrets, besimna demalka Mashiach. There will come a time, our time, when the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the wisdom that Rabbi Shimon it says, what does it mean that he revealed and concealed? Because nature, the world, was not ready to receive this light. But when the time comes, Rabbi Yehuda says, and the world once again, or the people of the world, any one of us who takes upon ourselves this responsibility to invest the world, to invest nature with wisdom, to invest the people of the world with nature, Malah Haaretz then will come the time that the earth will be filled with the wisdom. That's our work. And then it says, Nobody will have to teach anybody, nobody will have to teach nature, there will be no need for miracles because nature will be acting in a wise way. Because every, the wisdom, consciousness will be everywhere in the earth, in nature, in people. This is the purpose. What was this Shabbat, he said? Moses sends the spies to the land of Israel. For what purpose? Only one purpose. He says, we need to enter. And entering the understanding means we have to elevate to a place of what's called the Gemara the end of the direction. Removal of pain, suffering, and death. We can't do this naturally. Which means if we try to enter into the space with whatever abilities we have, we'll be overwhelmed. We need you. He chose the 12 of the most elevated souls. You can compare them to Shimon and the students. Enter into the land invested with wisdom. Go there, and every single day you're there, you will have, and this is what happened, you will have battles in your consciousness. Your stupid nature is going to want to overrule your, your smart nature. You have to fight that because I need you, 12, he said, to go into the land and fight and live only with your smart nature for those 40 days and only study in that, in that land for 40 days because then what will happen, you will infuse the land with wisdom and then we can come in. And then we can enter all these millions of people who can partake of that life. But they, unfortunately, like so many times, we... We're not able to maintain that consciousness. They were not able to infuse the land in those 40 days with wisdom. And it was, therefore, in truth, Eretz Ocheret Yoshvea, a land that was going to eat up all those who entered into it. Because nature remained. It was not changed. It was not made smart. It was not made wise. <coughs> and every single one of us, the Kabbalists explained, every single portion that we read and every single lesson that we hear is for us today, now, which means that every single one of us, wherever we are in our spiritual development, we are standing in front of an amazing land. <clears throat> we are standing in front of an amazing light, but one that unless transformed from stupid to wise through our actions and the use of the Zohar and the use of the wisdom, will be chas shalom the experience of Eretz of Yoshua, a land that swallows up. 
Moses asks us on this Shabbat, the Creator asks us on this Shabbat, as He asked those 12 elevated souls thousands of years ago, create a smart nature. Use your smart nature to overrule your stupid nature so that you can invest nature with wisdom. Use the light and tools of Kabbalah and the Zohar to invest nature with wisdom so that that can be your experience. So that that can be your experience. This is the choice that we have to live in this way, to act in this way, and now not just continue our spiritual work in a new way, in a stronger way, understanding that again, Has Shalom thinking as they did that the Israelites the next morning they get up and say, No, let's just go in. You said Moses and Moses was going to eventually happen, it could happen tomorrow. They tried, they died. Because it's a process by which we have to actively and forcefully educate nature. So not just continuing in our spiritual work, but understanding that I and that every one of us is going to need, if we don't, don't already, we will need nature to be smart. Maybe it's tomorrow, maybe it's next year, maybe it's 20 years from now. But if we're not educating nature around us, Shalom, nature remains stupid towards us. And worse than that, the work that we, met, we are meant to be doing for the world, educating nature so that Malah Ha'aret De'ah and Hashem, so that earth and nature becomes filled with wisdom that no longer does harm, but rather supports and brings light and life to every single one of us and every single purpose person in this world. That purpose has to be achieved. And therefore, on this Shabbat, again, the Creator is giving us the ability to become reawakened to the clarity of our work, to the clarity of choosing more forcefully smart nature over stupid nature, investing ourselves and the world with wisdom, wisdom into nature, and no longer miracles, but simply the way nature should be, the way the world should be. So much more.